People who are happy, passionate, and successful are everywhere, right? Can't we just turn to them to see what they did to get there? Not quite. A few years ago, Gallup conducted an international poll that included questions about workplace happiness and engagement. How many people said they felt engaged at work? Was it A, 65%, B, 35%, or C, 15%? If you guessed A, you're way off. The answer is C. Only 15% of people worldwide said they felt engaged at work. That means that 85% of people around the world don't find meaning and purpose in what they do. Considering that, according to writer Gemma Curtis, we spend 13 years and two months of our lives at work. That's a lot of time being upset. But when we look around, we see a different story, right? Social media posts show people pursuing their dreams and living their best lives. And news and interviews showcase entrepreneurs stumbling on that great idea, creating a company and selling it all before age 25. Yet as we just saw, the statistics don't bear this out. In Japan, a whopping 94% of survey respondents said that they're not engaged at work. It's a bit better in the US, but not much. Only 30% of workers say they're happier with their work. This is colliding with what Gallup says is an increased focus on the value of work among millennials. They want a job and a career that's dream worthy. Keep dreaming, it was worth a shot. So in a world that's so unhappy at work, how do we make that dream come true? There's a single powerful secret I'm gonna share that will help you sort it all out. There's a Zen story about two monks standing in the garden of the monastery, watching some prayer flags waving in the distance. One monk comments, the wind is moving. The other monk shakes his head. No, he says, it's the flags that are moving. A senior monk walks by and the two monks ask his opinion. He said, you are both wrong. It is your mind that is moving. That's the powerful secret, that in life it's actually less about what you experience and more about how you experience it that's important. The truth is actually less about what job you have and more about how you do it that shapes the quality of your life. That actually makes a lot of sense. Katrina Lake didn't know what to do after college, so she decided to work at a consulting firm. It was there that she became curious about what would happen if you married technology with clothing retail. Her initial idea flopped, but she kept exploring, going on to work for a venture capital firm, then on to business school. Finally, Lake had her big idea. She would marry personal shopping with online clothes buying. She started shopping for her friends and keeping meticulous data about what they liked and didn't and why. Business plan and spreadsheets in hand, she began to search for funding and was turned down by more than 50 different venture capitalists. That didn't stop her though. Periodically, she would get just enough money to keep going and building her idea. In 2017, Lake became the youngest woman in history to take a company public, and in 2020, Stitch Fix was valued at $3.37 billion. Lake did an interview with the podcast Skimmed from the couch and was asked the worst piece of advice she'd ever gotten. What was it? Follow your dreams. Lake says the notion that your job should be your dream job is misleading. So many parts of this job have not been a dream, she said. Whether it was struggling to raise money, cramming to get Stitch Fix boxes out the door on time, or being the one who had to go out and buy a new printer when theirs broke down. Here's the thing, you can be a stockbroker who makes millions of dollars, but is miserable. Or you can be a grocery clerk who changes others' lives simply with your kindness and caring. The difference lies in how you approach life. And that difference comes from your motivation. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, manage time intelligently. According to writer Gemma Curtis, 
each of us has on average 28,835 days in our lives. Of that time, we spend 33 years in bed, seven of them trying to fall asleep. One year and four months exercising, unless you're my wife, I'm guessing we'll spend something like five years exercising, she loves it. We spend 11 years and four months on non-work screen time. And eight years and four months of that is spent watching TV with the rest on social media. In fact, we spend six times longer watching TV and two times longer on social media than exercising. Yet experts say that even just 10 minutes of exercise a day would increase the overall quality of our sleep. 10 minutes? See how it's all interconnected? We'll also spend about three years on vacation. That might sound like a lot, but compare that to the 13 years and two months we'll spend at work. Unless you're Elon Musk, who says he spent 15 years working 100 hours or more a week, he's been known to sleep under his desk. Ladies, most of you will spend about 136 days getting ready. Guys, it's about 46 days for you, unless you're me. We spend four years and six months eating. 66% of workers say they eat meals at their desks. We spend 235 days waiting in line. After all of that, it's no wonder that we spend just one year and three days of our lives socializing. But here's some good news. We spend about 115 days of our lives laughing. <laughs> it's pretty shocking, right? Who knew we were spending so much time on things we probably don't really care about and so little on the things we do? Here's the thing, and I say this in my book, Think Like a Monk. No matter what you think your values are, your actions tell the real story. Sure, there are things we have to do, like go to work, but when we have free time, we dedicate that time to what we value. You may say and even believe that you value time with your partner or your kids most of all, but when you have spare time, time, you're more often scrolling on your phone or with your friends. There's a well-known saying by Ben Franklin, and it's worth remembering. It goes, when you take care of the minutes, the hours will take care of themselves. When we don't spend our time on what we value, mostly that's not on purpose. It's because we're simply not paying attention. Part of that is because for a lot of us, by the time we have spare time, we're wiped out and it's just hard to get motivated to change gears. I need my sleep. The other reason we waste time is we discount the value of our minutes. You're probably familiar with the dreaded time gap. That's what I call the mysterious black hole where our missing time goes. You know, when you're at work and you sit down to do something, but then a headline pops up on your news alerts and you click on it and the next you look at the clock, it's 45 minutes later and you don't know where the time went. Or when you get home and you're about to change your clothes to get some exercise, but first you just want to forward this hilarious meme to a friend and then all of a sudden, 90 minutes have gone by and you're still sitting on your couch. I must have lost track of time. We lose time because we treat our minutes like dimes. A dime isn't worth much to most, right? It's just like 10 cents. If we were walking down the street and saw a dime, most of us wouldn't even stop to pick it up. According to data from Provision Living, the average American spends 324 minutes on their phone every day. If you measured that in dimes, over a single day you'd have enough money to pay for a drop in yoga or meditation class. Over seven days, you'd have enough to pay for organic groceries for a week for two people. Over a month, you could take a long weekend at a deluxe Airbnb. But let's say you didn't spend those dimes, but instead put them in a basic savings account. By the end of the year, you'd have $11,826. But forget dimes. In actual minutes, if you spend just an hour less on your mobile phone per day, you'd have an extra 21,900 minutes per year. That's a lot of time saved and a lot more time to do the things that support you, your health, your well-being, along with the other things and people you value. Rule number three, avoid negativity. It's one of the biggest and most common things that wears us out and weighs us down every single day. Starting from the time we wake up, negativity. Doesn't it often feel like everywhere you look, most of the headlines and social media posts, even messages from your friends and family are negative? Why does it seem like no matter where we turn, negativity is just coming at us from every direction? I'm not about that negativity. When it comes to negativity, research tells us some interesting things about human behavior. Scientists from McGill University set up a study that participants were told was about observing their eye tracking patterns while they read news from a web page. Really, the scientists 
just wanted to see which articles the participants picked and overwhelmingly, it was negative articles. But why? Another study reported in Adweek showed that on average, negative headlines outperform positive headlines by 63%. And data from Pew Research says that two thirds of Americans say they feel worn out by the sheer amount of news that's out there. Just the quantity is tiring and negative. It's way too much. It's just too much. Researchers also estimate that up to 80% of our thoughts every day are negative. So I'm going to give you three ways to lighten your negativity load so you can start feeling more energized and positively engaged. Scientists have concluded that our overconsumption of negativity is due, at least in part, to something called negativity bias. We're wired to detect threats, so we give more of our attention to things that are negative. So let's say you're out on a hike in a gorgeous location. There might be 99 beautiful things to take in about your surroundings. The birds, the trees, the cascading waterfall. But the second you hear a little rustle in the bushes, all of your attention will go to that one sound because your brain is worried it could be a threat. Did you hear that? There's also research that sheds some light on what encourages negativity in our social circles. According to neuroscientists, certain receptors for dopamine, the reward chemical, actually become unavailable when we don't give a socially desirable response to others. If your friends say, let's go to the ABC Grill for lunch, you're more likely to get that feel-good dopamine hit if you say, sounds great, even if that's not what you want to eat. Our brains want us to fit in. If you've ever participated in gossip or other negative behavior and then wondered why you did that, this helps to explain it. Well, I feel better about myself. The negativity odds may feel like they're stacked against us, but we really can decrease the negativity in our lives. And we do it through small, simple choices made consistently. Going along with your friends, even though you disagree, is like someone offering you a sugary candy bar. It's hard to resist and tastes great in the moment, but later you feel the weight of that choice when you're burned out, tired, potentially depressed. I made a mistake. That food analogy can be helpful when looking at the negativity in our lives. Like junk food, junk thoughts and junk behavior are weighing us down. If I'm giving myself a steady diet of refined sugar and processed food, if that's what I'm ingesting, I'm going to be tired and cranky. I'm awake, I'm awake. But if I eat lots of fresh produce, if I'm consuming things that are more positive, I'm going to feel energized. I'll feel more motivated, my mood will be better, and my thoughts will be clearer. And that makes it easier to make healthy decisions. It's self-perpetuating. Have you ever found it? When you're tired, you eat worse. When you eat worse, you're more tired. If our daily diet is made up of judgment and anger, we're going to feel terrible. We won't be as creative and we won't feel inspired. Studies even show we won't be as physically healthy because people who are mostly negative get sick more often. Rule number four, find your core values. It all starts in childhood. We want to be loved and accepted. That's completely normal. But because of this need for love and acceptance from just a few years of age, we begin to live according to what others want for and from us. We form ideas about who and how we should be based on what parts of us, our behavior and personality, are welcome and praised and which are not. I like that about him. We also learn by imitating what we see others doing. As we grow older, we shape our likes and dislikes according to the people we surround ourselves with. For example, according to data from Adweek, among 18 to 34 year olds, 68% said that their peers' social media posts were at least somewhat likely to influence them to make a purchase. I, I, I got one for myself, see? Soon these attitudes and behaviors we're imitating become indistinguishable to us from who we really are. What have I become? In a pair of studies, researchers reviewed data from three different seasons of the Premier League football play and concluded that referees systematically favored home teams by shortening close games where the home team is ahead and lengthening close games when the home team is behind. The reason? Pressure from the home crowd. So when it comes to making decisions, we change our own picture of reality to avoid the discomfort that comes when we go against what others think. And that's just strangers. Imagine the influence of our friends, our families and co-workers and the effect they have on us. Yeah, but I'm your brother, we're family. What finally does make us question our thoughts and behavior is often that we hit a wall. Maybe we wake up one day and realize we're dreading going to work. Maybe we're sitting with a group of friends and suddenly we think, 
what am I doing here? I don't fit in with these people. And then we end up asking even more powerful questions like, what do I want to do with my life? And who am I, really? As billionaire investor Warren Buffett once said, chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. And maybe that's how you feel, like you're being weighed down by this version of you that you've been pretending to be or had to be because of life. Imagine your life was an empty jar. If you're filling that jar with ideas and beliefs that are not yours, you're living a life that isn't yours. The first type of filler we put in our lives that blocks us from knowing ourselves is other people's opinions. So many of us are in constant disconnect with ourselves because we're always validating or verifying others' opinions of us. So, what do you think? We let others' ideas and beliefs define how we feel instead of being guided by our own values. Following others' opinions blindly can quickly get us lost. Before I decided to become a monk, I was training to be an investment banker or work in business. When I stopped to look at why I was chasing this career that I wasn't really interested in, I realized I was following my community's definition of success and not my own. This isn't me. Step back and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it because it's what you truly want? Or is it because it's society's or someone else's opinion of what you should do or want? If you want to know yourself, and if you want to experience meaning and purpose, this is the kind of stuff you want to fill your life with. Your values should come first. When you isolate your values, you'll start to see more clearly what's important to you. You'll start to get a sense of your passion and your purpose. And you'll be able to start to see and understand what choices will bring you closer to the life of your dreams. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, connect with intrinsic motivation. Social scientist Tim Kasser studies values and goals, including two types of motivation, extrinsic, such as for money, image, or status, and intrinsic, such as for personal growth, close relationships, and making the world a better place. He and his colleagues have consistently found that people who place a high value on extrinsic versus intrinsic goals are less happy and report lower levels of satisfaction with life, along with higher levels of anxiety and depression. And external rewards can even decrease the internal motivation you already have. Researchers took a group of kids at a nursery school who had a natural love of drawing. In one group, the children were just left to draw. In another, they were told they could earn a good player award, which included a ribbon and a certificate, if they drew a picture. Two weeks later, the same kids were offered the opportunity to draw pictures. Those who were allowed to just draw showed the same high level of interest in drawing the second time around. But those who were told they could earn a reward by drawing a picture the first time around were half as likely to want to draw another picture. What's in it for me? The external reward actually made them less motivated to draw. When we do things out of intrinsic motivation, we're more likely to find meaning and purpose in our lives and our work. For Katrina Lake, it was her love of data, along with wanting to answer the question, what could the future of retail look like? Here are three ways to connect with your intrinsic motivation. First, live for who you want to become. Create a vision of who you want to be in five years. In that vision of yourself, list out five ways you're feeling about your life and your work and your relationships. Are you excited, joyful, satisfied, fulfilled, driven, confident? Be as specific as possible. Now, for the next week, every time you make a choice, ask yourself if that choice will bring you closer to or take you further away from that vision of yourself in five years. Do you wanna play a video game or read a book? Do you wanna watch a movie or have a conversation? Do you want to take a class or waste time scrolling on social media? Hey, 
There's nothing wrong with any of those things I said. I love them all. But we need the right ratio. We need to make sure that more of our steps are leading us towards who we want to be than away. It's simple math. Tip number two is discover where you can connect something you're already doing or have a natural strength or inclination for to something you're passionate about, that connection point. Your passion doesn't have to pay you, but if your current job can pay your passion, that might just be as good and a good start. Check this out. When computer science professor Louis Von Ahn set out to create Duolingo, he had one motivation to make learning free. As a kid growing up in poverty, he saw so many kids who didn't have access to quality education. So he and a partner created Duolingo, a language learning app that's now used by more than 40 million people worldwide. And while the company has become tremendously profitable, Arn's motivation was never about making money. It was about giving back. That's major intrinsic motivation, connecting your passion with a larger purpose. One of my greatest loves and one of the things that motivates me is learning. And that's the third tip. Learning to love learning and no matter what you do in life, you cannot fail. If you look at every situation and ask yourself, what can I learn here? You're going to experience two things. You'll get to feel curiosity, awe and wonder. Three things that research shows contribute to feeling satisfaction and meaning in your life. And second, if you're always focused on learning, you will never be disappointed because even when something doesn't go the way you'd hoped or planned, you can learn from it. As Katrina Lake says, I think a lot of people find themselves unhappy in their jobs because it's not their dream. But I think at the end of the day, if you're learning and if you're working with great people, that's going to be a rewarding experience. And that's how you too can have a rewarding, fulfilling, purposeful life and career. Rule number six, practice gratitude. Have you ever had that vacation that you've been getting ready for, that you've been so psyched about, and by the time you're ready, packing, getting ready to leave, what's happening? Stress, right? You're running around like, what do I pack? Did we put out the note for the dog sitter? Where's our Uber? All right, here. I know my wife and I can have our moments when we're both trying to tie things up and get ready for some time off, and it's ridiculous, right? That that's how we're starting out. As we set out on our journey this new year, let's spend some time and energy deliberately setting our mindset. We're going to do it with gratitude, and here's how. Writer Marcel Proust once said, let us be grateful for the people who make us happy. They are the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. Kelly McGonagall is a professor and researcher at Stanford University, and her work centers on this idea that stress is neither good nor bad. It's our reaction to it that matters. She says that one of the most effective positive ways we can deal with stress is to practice gratitude. But not just any kind of gratitude. Specifically, she says that it's the gratitude that focuses on others and their impact on our lives that's most effective. Dr. McGonagall says that stress is designed to motivate us to get us to do something. In the case of the stress of loneliness, for example, it's designed to move us to connect. And when we can feel gratitude for things others have done for us, it helps us feel more hopeful, more willing to seek help and support and to offer help and support to others. Sounds like an amazing mindset to start out with, right? Yeah, it does. So every day for one week, each morning when you get up, spend three to five minutes diving deep into one beautiful or meaningful thing someone has done for you in your life. Be specific. You're grateful to your mom for helping you with your homework. Or you're grateful for your best friend in fifth grade for that time he stood up to someone who is bullying you. And of course, it can be something in recent memory too. Be sure to remember the sights, sounds, and smells and what was said so you can really reinforce that memory in your body and in your brain. Rule number seven, turn pain into progress. Beth Knopic understands. Eight years ago, she lost her 16-year-old daughter, Liana, when suddenly and inexplicably, a virus Liana contracted migrated to her heart and could not be cured. After a tumultuous month in the hospital, Beth's vibrant, joyful, athletic daughter was gone. It's every parent's worst nightmare, and as you'd imagine, it catapulted Beth into what seemed like bottomless grief. And yet last year, something incredible happened. 
Beth gathered 14 other mothers in and around her Florida town who had all lost children for lunch. She says there wasn't a dry eye in the room, only the tears weren't from sadness. They were from joy. Somehow each one of these mothers, some of whom had lost more than one child, were able to share positive, loving memories of their children along with the beautiful ways their lives had changed as a result of their profound loss. Of course, every one of these women would rather have had their children back. But remarkably, they were able to take what had happened and allow something powerful to grow from it. As one of my good friends Ray Dalio says, pain plus reflection equals progress. Rule number eight, follow your curiosity. The first thing is that purpose is like an adult, right? Finding your purpose is like an adult in terms of growth. Passion is like a teenager, but before you become a teenager, what are you? You're a child. Child is like the interest, and before you're a child, you're a baby. That's curiosity. So at the baby stage of passion, what you first need is curiosity. That curiosity turns into an interest, that interest turns into a passion, that passion turns into a purpose. For so many of us, we get stuck trying to be like, well, what's my passion? It's like saying, well, I should be a teenager before I'm even a baby. Let's first learn to crawl before we learn to walk or run or fly. So when we start that, we ask ourselves, what am I curious about? What could I watch documentaries about forever? What could I get excited about learning forever? What is it that I keep getting up to do even if I fail? What is it that I get motivated to learn about or hear about or read about or watch about even when I don't know so much about it? What are you naturally curious about and drawn towards in your life? That is the birthplace of your passion. It doesn't have to be a passion just yet. It just needs to be a curiosity or an interest. Rule number nine, tune up your self-awareness. When you're going on a long car trip, you take your car to the mechanic first, right? To get things recalibrated, realigned, and ready to go. That's our second M. How we're going to recalibrate for our new journey is to adjust our self-awareness. Neuroscientist David Eagleman says that as far as our brains are concerned as adults, we are more like our peers than our childhood selves. Yet when we think about who we are, we mostly base our ideas on our younger self. So, tune up your self-awareness. You're going to go on a data-gathering expedition among those who know you best. Simon Sinek, the author of Start With Why, has a great exercise for this. When people say, I don't know what I'm good at, or I don't really know what my unique abilities are, that's because it can be hard to get an accurate picture of yourself from the inside, right? There's a saying that you can't read the label from inside the jar. So you're going to ask people outside your jar to help you out. Can you help me? You're going to ask three to five people who know you well, it may be personal, professional, friends, to describe for you what makes you special. Ask them, Simon recommends, why are you friends with me? Why did you pick me as your partner? Or what makes me stand out as an employee? Or what do you really like about me as your parent? Now beware, most people will answer first with something general. You're smart, you're funny, you're a good listener. That's not deep enough. Anything else? Ask for more. For example, lots of people are funny. Why are you friends with me instead of someone else who's funny? Or lots of employees are dedicated. Can you give me more detail, like a specific incident or example that really showed you that? Tell me more. Then you'll start getting the truly helpful data and information, such as, I love the way you use humor to make other people feel welcome and comfortable. Or you have this ability to take our discussions deeper by bringing in insights from lots of other fields. That's very nice of you to say. You start to see yourself through others' eyes and get an understanding of what's working, what your strengths are that you can go deeper on and maximize, and what makes you uniquely you. Here's an awesome idea. Convene a feel-good roundtable in person or over Zoom with a few good friends or family members, or even do this with coworkers, where you go around and tell each other some of your greatest strengths in detail. Then you're spreading the love and the joy and the support as well, and it doesn't feel as awkward as just asking it for yourself. Please don't make this awkward for me. Okay, so what else do we need to start a journey strong? We need some idea of where we're going, right? A map. That's our third M. 
You've just learned about all these great things you've got going for you, but no doubt you also have an area or two, or 12, that's me, where you'd like to grow. So we're going to create a map of how to get there. And one way you can do that is to pick a mentor. Someone who embodies that quality or those qualities you're looking to grow this year. One of my greatest mentors is Martin Luther King Jr. Specifically the way he inspired people for a meaningful cause and connected people through his powerful words. Maybe if you want to become better at relating to others, your mentor is Oprah Winfrey. Maybe if you want to be more strategic and thoughtful when it comes to business, it's your father or mother. That was the case for John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods. His father was his business mentor for years. Maybe if you want to cultivate innovation or persistence, your mentor is someone like Sir James Dyson or Richard Branson. Next, figure out basic simple ways to connect with your mentor regularly. If it's not someone you can connect with in real life, you can read their work, watch their videos, listen to a podcast, read about their lives, tape an inspiring fact about them or quote from them above your desk or put it into your wallet. Remember, it's not that you want to mimic your mentor. You want to be yourself and combine those strengths you're developing with those great strengths you already have in place. But if you look at some of the geography your mentor has traveled, it can help provide you with your own map for developing those strengths. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is stop wasting money. In a 2019 employee survey at PwC, 71% of millennials said their money stress had gone up over the past year. It is stressing me out. And nearly half of all respondents said that they spend three hours or more every week thinking about or trying to sort out their finances. And money woes don't just affect us individually. 44% of young adults said that the money is the number one stressor in their relationship. I need to borrow some money. And check out these stats. According to Erin Lowry, creator of the Broke Millennial blog, the average millennial graduated with $37,000 in student debt. That's in the States, and some have much more. That's enough to buy a brand new car or put a down payment on a house. Maybe you're like, yeah, don't remind me, Jay. Hey, I get it. Lots of us come from tough places financially, and you might be there now. Growing up, my family definitely was not what you'd call wealthy. For some of us, the hard times actually helped spur us on to success. Here's one of the stories that's really inspired me. It's of a young man who at 14 was evicted with his mother from their apartment and couldn't afford a place to live. By the time he was 16, he was arrested multiple times. Though he went on to secure a spot to play American football at a top college, in his junior year, he lost his spot and his NFL career opportunities with it. At one point, he found himself with only $7 in his pocket, but he kept working and striving. And today, Dwayne The Rock Johnson says that every time he experiences a big moment of success, he reminds himself of those early struggles when his back was up against the wall and the only way to go was forward. And that's why he named his company Seven Bucks Productions. Still, even if you don't have aspirations of becoming a mega movie star, financial security is within reach. And the place to start is to stop wasting money. Now, a little disclaimer first. What I'm going to share with you is for informational purposes only. It is definitely not intended as formal, legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. You want to consult a qualified licensed professional for that. Okay, so here are those five big areas where you can stop wasting money and get yourself on track financially. Take notes, boys. Let's start with a super common one that's really simple. Financial expert Suze Orman says, if you're buying a coffee every day, you may be literally flushing your chance to be a millionaire down the drain. You know, because after the coffee goes through your body, Okay, never mind, you get it. Anyway, Orman says that if you invested that $100 or more per month, so many of us spend on coffee in a Roth retirement account over 40 years with compound interest, you'd have a million dollars. What? That's worth making your own coffee, right? Actually, the entire category of food and drink is a big one. Not only do we spend loads of money eating out for dinner, another big money waster people often overlook is lunch. Here's a quick quiz. How much do you think the average person spends on lunch in a year according to Visa? Is it A, $520, B, $1,280, and C, $2,746? 
If you guess C, you're right. The average person spends $2,746 per year on lunches. Now check this out. If instead of buying lunch, you invested that money every month in a basic savings account, over 20 years, you'd have, I hope you're sitting down, because this is unbelievable, you'd have $60,760.41. I'm gonna sit down. And that's just with basic compounding interest. Okay, so here's another big way we waste money, buying new. Now here's the thing, I know for lots of us, I'll be honest, myself included, how we look is important. We enjoy fashion, but you can continue to have your unique look and have favorite brands and still spend less money on clothing. Here's a way to do that. I have another friend who's into designer brands but would never pay designer prices. Her secret is to shop at consignment stores. And now that there are lots of these stores online, there are tons of items to choose from. And you can even shop by your favorite brands. The other month, I complimented my friend on a sweater and she told me she got it for 65% less than the original price. And it came brand new with the tags still attached. Plus, shopping consignment also benefits the environment because we're recirculating clothes instead of just making more stuff. Beyond clothing, there are loads of things we tend to buy brand new that we really don't need to. For example, if your iPhone breaks, you can actually buy a refurbished one directly from Apple for way less money. And they come with a warranty. And don't get me started on cars. Here's another quiz. When you drive a new car off the lot, it literally immediately loses a certain percentage of its value. What percentage is it? A, 5%, B, 10%, or C, 30%. The answer is B. According to Carfax, the second you drive a new car off the lot, it loses at least 10% in value. Over the first year, it loses about 20% of its value. That means if you spend $30,000 on a brand new car, within a year, it's worth only $24,000, and the value just keeps going down. Instead of needing everything brand new, look at what you can buy used or borrow from someone you know. And that's another way we waste money. We buy things immediately. We think of it, we get all excited, we go online and buy it. It's like when the Apple Watch first came out and I went out and bought one. I was so stoked. But no offense to the product, I discovered pretty quickly, just in time to give it back, that I didn't actually need it. I ended up returning it. Take it back. Instead of impulse buying, batch your purchases. If you say, oh, I need to buy that, whatever it may be, and then go to Amazon and buy it, and then later in the day, oh, I wanted to get some of that other thing I love, and then go into Amazon or another store to buy that. What happens? When you get your card statement, it all adds up, and you're like, whoa, how did I spend that much money? I don't remember any of that. And that's because $15 here, and $10 there doesn't seem like much of the time, especially when you're using a credit card or other digital payment, because you don't see the money, you don't feel it, you don't actually have that experience of giving it away or holding on to it. Instead, when you think of something you need, and I'm putting need in quotes, because it might not be a real need, but a want. Put it in your cart and leave it there, or write it down on a list. Don't buy it right away. Then at some specified time, like the end of the week, look at your list or your carts and choose what it is you really need. That will give you a better idea of what you're actually spending and what you actually need versus what you want. On a mental level, what's self-awareness? Knowing what type of people I like to be with. Knowing who helps me grow and who drains me. Yeah. That's mental self-awareness. So self-awareness at every level, and then we go into the spiritual consciousness level. That's disconnecting from all these identities and understanding the identity that we are wired for generosity and we're wired to serve. And only in service can we be happy. And that's us on a consciousness level. That's the identity of consciousness. Like water is wet, the sun is heating in light. Consciousness is service. Mm. Like that's how it fits. Why are we wired for that? We're wired for that because all of us as consciousness have been designed and we see it since like even kids. Like I was, I was giving this example of this beautiful, and you may have seen it. It, it, it went viral on Instagram. It was this little girl, probably about two years old, watching a cartoon and she takes a handkerchief and the cartoon character is crying and she goes up to the television no. and she tries to wipe it off, right? And it's, it's, it's incredible because this girl's two years old and she thinks this cartoon character animal is crying. 
and she gets a real tissue and tries to wipe it on the TV. Obviously, it doesn't work. And there's another another one that I saw with this statue of this rabbit, and there's like four rabbits, and one rabbit's like falling off the end, uh -huh. and this little boy is trying to push the rabbit up, but it's a stone rabbit. It's just a statue, but he's trying to help it back up. So we see, and there was a great article in Wired about this, about how we're wired for generosity. Our, our brain is happier in service. This whole world is almost a school and education system to make us realize that one truth. And we see that when we're serving, when we're doing that, we feel genuine happiness. But when we're trying to gain and greed and power and strength, we, we even feel empty as it slips through our fingers. So the why is because that allows us to connect to our deepest self, the happiest self that we have. And modern studies have shown that. So Michael Norton at Cambridge University, he did a study where they gave people five, 10, $20 to spend on themselves. Have you seen this? Go ahead. Though, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then they spent five, 10, $20 on others. So people spent five, 10, $20 on makeup, Starbucks, and normal stuff, <laughs> right? right, right? right, that, right. Was the, that was the three, common, three, makeup, Starbucks, and then something else, I can't remember. And then people who spend on other people, they also bought other, the same stuff. Starbucks was still in there. Yeah. And they're buying all this stuff. What they found is that when people self-assess their happiness before and after, without knowing about this A-B test, people who spent the money on themselves didn't feel any happier or any less happier. But the people that spent on others felt 10 to 20% happier. Mm. And then he went and tried this out. This was a college in, in the United States. They then went and did it in Africa. They did it all over the world and the stats and the patterns are the same. Wow. That we're wired for generosity, we're wired to serve, to make us realize that that's our real nature, that's our greatest self-awareness. I think one of the biggest mistakes I've made, and I think we make as humans, is we often look for divinity in humanity. Mm. You're looking for that divine person that has all the answers and that is infallible and perfect. And when you seek divinity in humanity, you're left with insecurity and anxiety because no one fulfills that divine search. And so for me, what I really had to understand as I went down that road and felt like I was let down and felt like people made me feel unworthy or unequipped was I recognized that there were four pillars of relationships and they are care, competence, consistency and character. Every single person in your life is going to be able to give you or should be able to give you at least one of these four characteristics. Very rarely, if ever, will one person give you all four. And if you're lucky, you might have a few people in your life that give you two or three. So let's talk about each of them. Care. My mom, there is no one in the world who cares for me more than my mom. She would do anything for me. She'd be there for me. All she wants to make sure, doesn't matter what I've achieved or what I've done. If she picks up the phone to me, her first question is, have you eaten? <laughs> what did you eat? Uh, are you safe? Are you healthy? Right? Like that's all she cares about. Now, my mom isn't the person that I go to for business advice, or she's not the person I'm saying hypothetically that I go to for social media advice. Mm. That's not her competence, but she doesn't need to be. She cares for me and that's what I get from her. Now let's go to competence. If I'm thinking about starting a business, new dragon <laughs> over here, right? Like you, you'd be a great friend to call up. You're someone who understands what it takes to get investors, scale a business, build teams, manage internationally, grow, scale, sell. Like you have that journey and you have that network, you have that career. I'd also care about you. I know you also care about me. So I've got two out of four in you. Yeah. And you've got good character. You don't have the consistency though because no. we don't see each other yeah. enough. So, so three out of four. 75%. Yeah, 75%. And so for that, for me, is that perfect example of there's competence there and there is care there, which is wonderful. And there's character there. I believe you're someone of good character. And that's the next one, character. There are some people in our life that hold us to higher values. They help us grow with greater integrity. They help us see things beyond what we're chasing. They make us look beyond our desires and make us recognize that there's so much more to life. And those people are massively important. And those people may not be the people we see every week. They may not be the people we see every day. They may not be the people that we call up, but you need them as your compass. The people with character are your compass. 
And then finally, you have the people that are consistent. You have some mates that you just know are always going to pick up the phone. Mm. You know that if you need to move house, you've got a family emergency, you know which friend you call. They may not be the competent business advisor. They may care about you, but they don't care about you as deeply as your mom does, but they are consistently always there for you. Mm. And that's beautiful. But the problem is when we look at our consistent friend, we think, well, why are you not competent? And we look at our competent friend, we think, why don't you have good character? We look at our character friend and say, well, why aren't you always there? And so we're always looking for which C they don't have mm. rather than appreciating for them for exactly what they bring to our life. I think we've come to a place where we feel that freedom and the freedom of unlimited choice is power. And we've all realized, and the science and the studies all show this, that the more choice we have, the worse mistakes we make. And we make poorer decisions based on this complete limitless choice. And I found that actually when you stripped away some of that choice, your ability to make decisions grew. My meditation teacher said to me, even in a shallow dive, you get wet, so still do it. Beautiful, <laughs> I love that, yeah. The first step is learning to appreciate where you are. Because if we can't appreciate where we are, we will never appreciate where we get to. And I often say to people, like, you're exactly where you need to be. And we're scared of accepting that because we're like, well, I don't like being here, but that's because we don't see it as part of our story. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of it truly is that I've seen the most powerful dreams be linked to service and impact. And so when your dream expands into having a service element, you get the opportunity to work harder than you've ever dreamed of, you're able to learn things that you never believed you could because we're so phenomenal at extending ourselves beyond what we know for people that we love and people we want to serve. Whenever you give out any energy, love, hate, anger, kindness, you will always get it back one way or another. Love is like a circle. Whatever love you give out, it always comes back to you. I was just showing Sally a Facebook memory backstage seven years ago. I love Facebook reminders. Look at this. It showed me that I was speaking to this little group of students about seven mistakes people make in their 20s. And it was a memory of a talk that I was giving six and seven years ago. I released my first video five years ago. So six and seven years ago, most people didn't know who I was and what I was doing. I had an event in London called Conscious Living. So it was on a Friday night in the city and five to 10 people would show up every week. That's it, five to 10 people. And I remember loving it and I remember feeling so happy and so grateful that five to 10 people showed up. And I feel the same way about the first five to 10 people that followed me and commented on my videos. And I feel the same way about the first five to 10 people when I finally got to meet them. And I found that if you can love one person, if you can deeply feel grateful for one person, then thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions will come from that. But if you struggle to be present and connected to that one person, it's really hard to be trusted by the universe with more. What is it that success looks like for you? And don't make it about a number. Don't make it about an account of views. Don't make it about a follower. Don't make it about a size of home because those things are great for success, but they're not great for happiness. My measure of success is, can I wake up and do something I love every day? Life is challenging. It's full of ups and downs. We think, I wish things could just be still. I wish things would stop changing. I wish my problems would go away. We want a life that's steady with a path that's flat. Yet as Deborah Evans once said, life is like an EKG. Without the ups and downs, you're not living. Because this is what a flat line looks like. And this is what a lifeline looks like. When we feel those highest highs, those extreme peaks, we're ecstatic to be on the summit. Then when we're in the lowest lows, those deep values, we're ready to submit. And so we try and play it safe and avoid all risks. 
But when we seek security and prioritize passiveness, we don't realize that a flat lifeline means we're dead. If we're always trying to live our lives at sea level, then we'll never see what life is truly about. That what we judge as good and bad are in fact deeply connected. How could we ever experience how wonderful happiness is if we never felt sadness? How could we taste the triumph of success if we never failed? How could we know the comfort of gratitude if we never experienced loss? Somehow we got the idea that being successful and moving forward in life means we're constantly moving up. But have you ever read a book, watched a movie or seen a case study like that? They don't exist. Every story worth telling has peaks and valleys, successes and setbacks. Our brains are wired for novelty. When something's new, whether it's a fantastic surprise or a huge challenge, our brains light up. We thrive on learning and our opportunities to grow. Yet our brains also easily become accustomed to patterns, making it harder for us to change. Dramatic disruptions help us break these patterns and invite us to see and experience the world in a whole new way. And as it turns out, we're designed for change all the way down to ourselves. Your body is constantly being reinvented, replacing most of itself every seven to 15 years, even down to our bones. The universe is constantly shifting and we are part of that. When we try and resist change, it goes against our very nature. In the journey of life, we experience pleasure and pain. There'll be sunshine and rain, there'll be loss and gain, but we must learn to keep moving forward again and again. So if you opened your eyes this morning, if you were healthy enough to move about, to maybe get yourself some food, if you were able to go to a refrigerator and find that it was full and stocked, if you were able to put on some clothes, and if you had a roof over your head, just remember how grateful you can be for all those things we consider to be basic, but for others, they don't even have access to. We can't stop life's ups and downs, but we can change how we experience them. We can learn to go with life's flow. Because as Helen Keller once said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. You can't be logical and creative at the same time. Your brain and mind is using different faculties and different abilities to do different types of tasks. Imagine you're in meetings all day about numbers and data and analytics, and all of a sudden you're asked to do something creative, maybe write a speech or give a presentation. It can be really, really difficult to switch from one side of your brain to the other side in a matter of seconds. With very little organizing and planning, we're literally going like a pendulum, swinging from one task to another, which is requiring different parts of our brain and the abilities that we have. The way I solve this is that I start every day by first writing down my to-do list. I look at all the activities that I have to do. Now in the examples I give in this video, I've simplified my task to make it easier, but know that I do this with a lot more detail. You want to draw a line down the middle of the page, on one side of it write logical, and on the other side of it write creative. You now want to plot and mark where these tasks on your to-do list fit, either in the logical category or in the creative category. The question you're asking yourself is, is this task largely structured, focused? Does it have certain boundaries? Is it quite a logical step-by-step -step process? Or is this creative? Is it more of a brainstorm? Is it somewhere where you need to feel free and express it? After you've divided these tasks, you now want to write down the time estimate that that specific task is going to take. What ends up happening is you start to plot your week by saying Monday is going to be creative, Tuesdays are logical, Wednesdays are logical, Thursdays are creative, and Fridays are creative. Or you may also divide your day up into logical mornings and creative afternoons or creative mornings and logical afternoons. This division, this time blocking, allows you to get really immersed into the activity, really focus and be more productive and effective. I think one of my first things in failure is 
don't take it more personally than it actually is. And I'll give an example of that. When I was applying to 40 companies that all rejected me <laughs> before an interview, yeah. all I was getting was an automated response saying your application will not go any further. I can't take that personally because they didn't meet me in person. They didn't have a interaction with me. They just saw my name. They saw I'd been a monk for three years. That resume is useless. I mean, sure. what's your transferable skills? Like right. sitting in silence and stillness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Surprise, surprise, no one wants to hire a monk. And so they rejected you, but that's not personal because they didn't meet me in person. But what if they had met you in person? Right, so that's the first step. The first yeah. step is don't take all fear failure. I'll give an example, me and you, we reach out to countless guests to be on our podcast. Mm -hmm. Who say no all the time. Who say no all the time. But if I don't hear a no from the guest directly, that's not a no. Like someone's team can say no, someone's assistant can say no, someone's PR team can say no, but until they say no personally, it's not a no. Okay, but when they do say no. Then that's a no, yeah. So then let's move so to So how that. do you deal yeah. with that type of failure? Yes, so if I deal with a failure where someone meets me in person and gets to know like, me. No, Jay, you're horrible, you <laughs> suck. Like, I don't want to deal with a monk ever in my life. Yeah. I would never go on your show. I'm never listening to you, never. Yeah. Then how do you deal with that type of so failure? So I've heard you say this, uh, I've said it a couple of times and I'm sure it's been repeated uh -huh. a bunch of times around how I genuinely believe failure has feedback. It's feedback, and, yeah. and so for me, it's like failure has the ability to actually tell you what you need to improve. Now, not to improve to get their attention, improving to get the actions that you want to take. Yeah, well, the results you want. The and results yeah. you want. And yeah. don't make that result about the person who said no. Don't try use failure as a way to prove someone else wrong. Because what happens when we prove others wrong? When you prove others wrong, you end up trying to get validation and approval for them, and now if they're not impressed when you're right, you lose again, so you end up losing twice. You, and you spend all this time and energy, years maybe, to prove someone wrong, I've been there many times, yeah. and then you're like, I felt good for a moment, yeah. and then I feel empty again. Totally, and, and so that's the thing about failure in the second half, is you have to see failure as an improvement. If, if I'm completely honest, everyone who rejected me in my life up until now has made me more hungry, taught me so much more about myself, and made me up my game. Yeah. And I think if failure doesn't make you up your game, it's the same as losing in a sport, right? When you fail and you've lost games and you've mm -hmm. won games yeah. you know, on the big stages. You didn't have the skills, you didn't have the teamwork, you guys weren't hungry enough, you whatever it is. You weren't communicating enough. There's something you were missing. Yeah. So you go review the game film, you check the stats, you see what could I have done better, and you try to improve that for the next game. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can do that in life, but we're so afraid to like go on the next game mm -hmm. of life. Like I got rejected once and it hurts so bad. Yeah. How do people learn to overcome that pain of rejection? Yeah. To yeah. keep going. Yeah. You know, in sports, luckily there's a season which is like you might have 30 basketball games. After you lose the first two, you don't say, uh, I'm just gonna give up the rest of the season. Yeah. You keep playing. Yes. But in life, a lot of people stop playing. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think that's great mental training too. I think yeah. sports is great mental training because you have to show up to the next game even if you lost and you don't feel bad. Exactly. That you don't feel good, sorry. And, and one of the things, before I dive into that question, one of the things that you reminded me of was the, the Last Dance documentary. Mm -hmm. So there's that season that Michael Jordan, everyone is agreement, in, in agreement that he is one of the best players to be playing. And they keep losing. And they didn't make the finals. Right? They didn't right, make yeah. the finals, they lost. And then they realize they need to get the team and they need to find, the, I think they bring in Dennis Rodman and then yeah. they start bringing in all these other players that strengthen. Whereas if they would have just said, oh, we got the best player in the world, we just keep doing this. I'm not sure they would have got there, right? But the coach, Phil Jackson and the team, they had to adapt. And so you're saying, why do we feel that pain in rejection and, and mm -hmm. how do we deal with mm -hmm. that? I think we feel that pain because we look at a failure Right, we look at it as a complete definition of us. Mm. Right, we're looking at it as as uh, there's that famous statement of like, you know, failure is an event, not a person. Right, and I don't know who said it, but it's one of those statements that that really clicks. Like, failure is uh, an event, not a person. Mm -hmm. Whereas we start thinking we are the failure. Mm. Like we say, I, I am, am a failure. failure. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite ways to start is looking at what we value. And values are a very intangible word, and so there's a very easy way to figure out what you value. There's two things you have to look at. You look at how you spend your money, the most painful thing you can possibly do, go through your bank statement, 
and look at where your money is being spent. That is what you value. The other thing that we spend, just like we spend money, is how we spend our time. Those are the two most perfect ways to see what you currently value. Your value isn't what's in your head, isn't what's in your heart, it isn't what's in your mind. It's how you spend your money and how you spend your time. And so just to give you an overview, and I share this in the book, that research was done on how we spend our time. And the research showed that we spend 33 years in bed, right? 33 years of our life in bed. And seven years of that is spent trying to sleep, not even sleeping, right? We spend one year and four months exercising across our whole lives, these are, by the way. We spend more than three years on vacation, uh, and we spend a bunch of days trying to get ready, and we spend a bunch of time, you know, standing in lines and queues, and so much of our time just gets spent. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, where am I currently spending my time, and where do I want to spend it? Now, studies also show that people, everyone has to go to work. So this isn't about what you do for work. People who had more meaningful, purposeful lives and were healthier, wealthier, and wise invested their time in education over entertainment. And Rangan, your, your audience is lucky because they get education and entertainment in one place. But, but that's the goal, right? Like that's the goal that you're creating an opportunity for people to find education. The, the smartest, the wealthiest, the most healthiest, the wisest people in the world were reading books, watching documentaries, taking courses, listening to podcasts, learning to better themselves. And so that's the first place to start. The second place, when we look at that value audit, is I want you to write down three things that you're currently pursuing in life. It might be a promotion, it might be a new home, whatever it is, whatever it is that you are currently pursuing. And then I want you to ask this question. Is that your desire and your dream? Or is it coming from something outside of you? Is it coming from a pressure of a family member? Is it coming from an expectation because your friend just bought something? Where is that desire truly coming from? And the third and final question you want to ask yourself is, do I still want to pursue that? Or do I want to change how I pursue it? Or do I not want to pursue it at all? And if you go through that three-step questioning process, you'll get to the truth of what you truly want to pursue and stop yourselves from building a sandcastle which the waves of time will eventually wash away. And so that's yeah. what we get lost doing. We get lost building castles that we don't even want to live in. If you had 100 hours to invest in your self-development, in what you were good at, what you were average at, and what you were bad at, how would you split that time? When this question was asked to 200 of the most healthy, wealthy, wise people in the world, what they found is that their percentages were 100, 0, 0, or 80, 10, 10. And the reason for this was very simple. When we focus on things we're naturally good at and we invest in them, we become exceptional at them. When we focus on things that we're average at, we may get good at them. And when we focus on things we're naturally bad at, we may become average at them. The hard skills that we have, the actual hard, tangible skills that we have, we should focus on our strengths. But when it comes to our qualities, our emotional intelligence, we should focus on our weaknesses. So if you have a challenge with something like listening, you don't go, oh yeah, Jay told me not to focus on my weaknesses, so I'm not gonna bother getting better at my listening. Right, listening is a, soft skill. If you have a weakness in a soft skill, you want to give that your energy. But if you have a strength in a hard skill, you want to give that your energy and focus. And usually we do it the other way around. If we're bad listeners but good at something else, we let it roll. We say, oh, that's okay. That, that's not a big deal. But when it comes to things like empathy, emotional intelligence, vulnerability, listening, communication, connection, these are things that we can improve in. And when it comes to our natural strengths, our skills, our hard skills, we can play to those as well. And when we play to our strengths, when we understand our role and our offering, and we recognize that actually that person has their offering, we recognize it's not that we disagree with each other, it's not that that person's trying to take me down, it's just that we speak different languages. We generally talk to people like they're exactly the same. And people generally talk to us like we're exactly the same. We usually expect that people will respond to things in the same way as we will. We just have this lens. 
until we start recognizing that there are different wirings for different people, so they all respond to different things. And there's a beautiful statement that's often attributed to Albert Einstein where he said that everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. And so many of us in our own life are either trying to be something or we're connecting with people differently. All of us can mindfully approach any conversation in the workplace with a partner, potentially even with a patient or wherever it is, understanding that person's language. The point being that everyone was trying to achieve the same goal. And I want you to do that. I want you to give yourself the benefit of the doubt and the people around you that everyone is trying to work towards the same goal. If we can just learn to speak each other's language, then we'll be able to improve our communication. I think the big thing is we all are looking for role models when we're growing up. Like I feel like we all had someone we looked up to. And I was just fortunate and I have to, I have to owe it to fortune and, and grace that I was so fortunate that when I was 18, one of my role models became a monk because my role models were celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, incredible people who are achieving a lot in the world. But when I met him, I got to meet someone who was truly happy. And I think we meet a lot of people who have a lot of money, who have a lot of success at a young age, but you rarely meet someone who's truly happy. And I think everyone who's listening right now will, or watching will be able to remember a time when they felt they met someone who is happy. And I'm sure that's a rare memory, but it exists. And I was so captivated by that happiness that I felt this person was experiencing that I was like, I want that. You know, and you feel that. Like, I always say that it's always the common denominator in the room. If you're in a room with someone who has millions of followers, you'll be like, oh, I want that. And if you're in the room with someone who has a yacht, you'll be like, oh, I want a yacht. And if someone lives in a fancy home, you'll be like, oh, I want a fancy home. Like, we always want what we feel in the room. Like, the person who has the most in the room becomes the most desirable. But for me, I was so fortunate to be in a room where someone was happy, and that became the most desirable thing. And I was just seeing around me, I was aware that I was looking at people around me who had money but were sad who had the love of everyone in the like relationships, whatever, like the best looking partners, whatever, and they still were sad. And I was just looking around me at 18 and observing that I couldn't meet someone who's really happy apart from this guy. And so I was like, I want that. So I ended up spending all my summer holidays from 18, aged 18 to 22, half of them in bars, steakhouses, and working in the world of finance in London, and the other half living as a monk in India. So I call it my first ever split test, or my AB test, where I was literally like, I'm gonna live the paradox. Like, I'm gonna go from living up large, like, you know, having fun, having the best relationships, drinking, going out, whatever it is, and I'm gonna compare that to the opposite. And I can totally say by doing that experiment four years later, I was convinced that the experiment of living as a monk was more meaningful, more purposeful, and made me more happy. So I was like, it's, it's a no-brainer. So that's how at an early age, it was just an experiment. And that's why my consistent recommendation to anyone listening is experiment with stuff, like try stuff out, go and live it for a week, live it for a weekend. Don't just think about it in your head. Like get out of your head and get into action. So if I just thought about it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But getting to experiment with it taught me so much. Can you talk about detachment? Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. like, that, that I think is, is, is one of the hardest things that we face today. It is, 100%. And, and one of the ways we were trained, and I'm not, I'm not recommending this to anyone watching, I'm just sharing how, how much we are obsessed and addicted to the body. We were trained to not look in the mirror. Oh, wow. So we didn't, I didn't look in a mirror for like three years. Wow. Right? Like effectively. <laughs> no way. Effectively, yeah. As in, I, I looked in a mirror now again when I had to shave my head or like whatever. Like, right. But you don't look in a mirror to look at your appearance. I'm not saying that, I, I don't recommend that before you go to work tomorrow or anything like that, but just listen to the principle carefully. You're going to get a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Jay, I can't yeah. even, yeah. what do I look like? Yeah, what do I look like? <laughs> no, just... So the, the reason is, and that's the reason why monks have shaved heads too, because you focus less on your physical appearance you spend less time on your physical appearance. What that allows you to do is it literally dissolves your understanding of your physical presence, which means all you have to deal with is the inside. Just think about how much attention it takes yeah. to keep ourselves well-groomed, to take care of ourselves, to our ego and attachment to how good so we look true. in the day. And I have it too, right? We all have it. Like I'm not saying I'm detached from that. But what I'm saying is that we were trained in the belief that if you're able to switch off and close your eyes, why do we close our eyes when we meditate? Right. It's because it detaches us from the physical presence of where we are so that we can go inside. Because most of us can't see ourselves 
in people. So then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. I right? just let that blow your mind for a moment. It's uh, so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible. And often the advice I give to people today is fast forward where you are, look at yourself in 10, 15, 20 years time and ask yourself the question, is that where I want to be? If you're in a company, look at the person who's 20 years ahead of you and ask yourself, is that where I want to be? If you're in a startup, look at where other startups have got to in similar roles and go, is that where I want to be? And if the answer is no, then you need to find a new path. We all face distraction. We all experience distraction. We're all plagued by distraction. But often we think that the opposite of distraction is focus. We think that we need to become more focused. We think that if we're focused, we'll feel less distracted. We feel that if we're able to draw our energy in a certain direction and force ourselves to absorb in an activity, then we won't be as distracted. But this is just not true. The opposite of distraction is actually not focus. The opposite of distraction is, wait for it, attraction. What we really need to do is increase our attraction. When we are attracted to something, we're naturally focused. We're naturally able to be present. We're naturally able to bring our attention and our energy to that task, that project, that person. When we're distracted and don't have that attraction, we're naturally all over the place. We end up feeling lost, confused, and end up procrastinating. But no matter what you do, no matter how much you chase your passion and live your purpose, there will still be things you have to do on a daily basis that you don't find interesting and naturally you will feel unfocused and distracted. For that, ask yourself this question, why am I here or why am I doing this? And you'll find the mind will start to become attracted to that activity, task or even that person. So there's a book that I love called The Journey Home. It's the story of a, a man who hitchhiked at the age of 19 from America and London across the world in search for the truth. And it's incredible because it shows that desire as a true seeker and it's got travel, it's got potential romance opportunity, it's got that sacrifice, it's got everything. And it's just, an, it's a true story, it's an autobiography. It's just a really incredible story of how someone can truly seek the truth and want to find themselves and what that takes and what that looks like. So that book is incredible. It's called The Journey Home by Radhanath Swami. It's an autobiography, it's incredible. I highly recommend it. And then the Bhagavad Gita is the book I studied as a monk. It's 5,000 years old. It's the story of a warrior uh, getting advice from a divine coach, getting insight into life. It's been, it's, it's a book that's like the classic of India. And today, most knowledge that I read seems like it stems from it. Like there's rarely a quote or a Instagram quote or a Tumblr quote that I find that wasn't influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's not the easiest read, but it's incredible if you dive into it with someone who knows it well. So the two extremes that most of us experience are either I have to think I'm the best, yes. I'm the best in the world, I can, do I can crush anyone, <laughs> like I'm like gonna show everyone what I'm like, or most of us experience the other extreme, which is I'm the worst. Mm. I'm the stupidest, I'm the dumbest, I'm the most worthless, I'm the biggest loser. Notice how that's both ego. Mm, the really? Ego, yes. Why is the negative so ego? So the ego wants to be the best of the best, or the ego wants to be the worst of the worst. The ego won't accept being in the middle. Really? The ego wants to feel the deepest sense of being the lowest. And that's why victim <laughs> mentality yes. is actually a subsequence of ego. Really? Yeah, that's how it's explained in the Bhagavad Gita because the point is that you can't deal with just being bad, you have to be the, the worst. worst. My yeah. pain is yeah. the worst. I exactly. think um, Jada talked about this yes. on your podcast where she was like, you know, I had to tell people why my hurt was more painful than their hurt and they could never understand how bad it was. Right? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's ego Yeah, as that's well. ego as well. So you see these two sides of ego keeping us locked away 
And so the only way to get with that and the only way to balance it and bring it all into one is genuine self-honesty. Honesty is the best place to be. And the best thing about honesty is I'm really good at this, I'm really average at that, and I'm really bad at that. Mm. And the challenge we have with that is most of us have no idea. We just have zero self-awareness about what we are good at, what we are bad at, and what we're average at. So we think, I'm pretty average at everything. I'm pretty good at everything. And when I hear those answers, I'm like, simple things, just go and talk to people that know you. Yeah, what am I great at? Ask them, what's my superpower? What do I do differently? What do you think I do that is different that no one else does? And guess what? I guarantee you, if you ask a colleague, if you ask a friend, if you ask a family member, if you ask a people from, they'll say different things. But you get to learn about yourself. So real confidence comes from knowing your strengths and going all in on them. Mm -hmm. Your confidence does not come from just standing up the right way or just saying the right stuff to yourself. Body like, language only. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's important. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in all of that, but what I'm saying is that that doesn't build real confidence. Yeah. Real confidence comes from thinking, I'm really good at this, I know I can do this, and I love doing it. And, it, and really, this is the most important bit. Confidence comes from serving other people. Mm-hmm. When you see the impact you have on others, and this is the biggest issue, the reason why we have such low self-esteem today in the world is because people are not serving others. So they don't see the profound impact they have on others. When you put out a video or a podcast and people tag you on Instagram and they say, Lewis, you stop me from depression or you help me out of a divorce. Yeah. Or people, when they watch my content, they'll be like, that stopped me from committing suicide or whatever it is. When you see that, you get such a deep sense of self-worth that you matter. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Everyone matters. Whether you matter to one people or one million people, everyone matters. Yeah. But if you see your impact on someone's life, you will feel such a deep sense of self-worth. And so whether you're serving at a, uh, giving out free food or whether you're serving at a local charity place or whether you're serving through your work, serve, 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 because when you take that step, you you get a boost of self-esteem. There are sometimes when I'm with a social media person who says something really useful for my roots and there's sometimes when I'm with roots and they say something else. And there's a great story actually about when the prime minister of India, Modi, he visited Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg interviewed him at Facebook at the headquarters. And Mark Zuckerberg told a story. He said that when he was struggling with the direction of Facebook in 2009, he went up to his mentor to ask a question. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's mentor happened to be Steve Jobs. And so he went up to Steve Jobs and he said, Steve, I'm struggling with the direction of Facebook. What do I do? And at that time, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. He could have said anything and Mm -hmm. it would have made sense. But you know, he could have said, go and meet a venture capitalist. He could have said, go and meet an investor. He could have said, go and meet a tech company. He could have said, I'll tell you what to do. Instead, he said, I think you need to go to India and spend some time in an ashram, a monastery in India with monks. He goes, when you do that, you'll find the answer of what you want to do. And to me, that is exactly why the people that are most successful in this world are successful because they surround themselves with people who have differing beliefs. And MIT did a research study on this. They found that people who are more innovative and creative in an organization knew people who didn't know each other. So when you know people who all know each other, you end up with the same answer, the same belief and confirmation bias exists Mm -hmm. and you just keep building that echo chamber. Whereas if you've got two people who don't agree and you get a checking system, then you can trust your gut and go with what you believe. So I think I try and move away from having people around me. And it's not just yes men or yes women, it's about it's not just about that, it's about building a circle of people, like you said, that want different things for you and knowing what they want for you. So when I'm with my mom, all my mom cares about is my health, <laughs> right? My mom does not care how successful I am, how many videos happen, how many people I help, even that. And my mom will get over that. She's like, how's your health? Like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Like that's my mom. And it's like, if I go and I measure everything most of that, that's wrong. But if I know that that's what my mom wants for me, that's beautiful. That's what I get from her and she'll take care of that. And same, you know, everyone plays a different role in your life. Don't expect everyone to play the role you want and don't expect everyone to play the same role. Recognize that everyone's playing their role in your life and let them play it. That's what makes a good movie. If everyone played the same role in a movie, it'd be boring. Very boring. Every day we recharge our phones, but we forget to recharge ourselves. Let's just say we slept well the night before, which means we start our day with a 100% charge. When we wake up in the morning, 
we roll over and 80% of us check our smartphones before we brush our teeth. We scroll through social media, we browse through emails. That takes away 10% of our energy. Let's say we now have 90% charge left. We then commute to work. We spend our day in the office, in meetings, interacting with colleagues, finishing off projects and assignments. We now have 40% charge left. On the way home, we commute through traffic or on the train and that takes away another, let's say 10%. We now have 30% charge left. We come home and switch on Netflix, talk to someone about what our day was like, and sometimes we lose another 10%. We now have 20% charge left. At 20% on our phones, usually the charge bar goes red. We get an alert. We get a message that tells us that we only have 20% battery left. The question is, do we notice when our charge is at 20% or 10%? There are always signs from our bodies, our brains, our minds. But are we tuned in? One of the best things we can do to recharge is to exercise. The hardest part of any workout is actually the 15 minutes leading up to it. We come up with 15 reasons why we don't want to sweat and we change our mind 15 different times. CNN reports that when you work out, your brain creates more serotonin, which sends messages to your nervous system of happiness and well-being. Working out for 30 to 40 minutes every day can recharge our battery by 20%. Meditation is an incredible way to recharge our batteries. Exactly what the gym does for the body, meditation can do for the mind. Meditation gives us downtime physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Meditation also directly impacts your entire nervous system by reducing your body's productions of stress-related chemicals such as cortisol. Meditation is a great way to recharge and can take you back up 20%. We've all heard about incredible morning routines, but the one thing that can make a huge difference to your recharge is your evening routine. 35% of us are not getting the recommended seven hours of sleep per night. Remember, every body and mind is different. Make sure you find the amount of time you need to get that serious battery recharge. And the 75-year study by Harvard found that beyond anything, the real sense check for happiness and meaning in life was relationships, connections, interactions with depth that are fulfilling and full of joy. Making time for deep, meaningful interactions every day can give the recharge our battery seriously needs. What if we've recharged ourselves as much as we recharge our phones? Because if we don't, we'll end up like one of our phones in the bottom of some drawer in our home. Because you made it this far in the video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from me, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. If you could make one change this year that would really move the needle, it would be to stop judging yourself for the content that you're making or the product you're putting out or the service.